evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming back. I told you that uh, no matter how cold it gets in Whangarei, this would be one, at least one place here which you know would be warm. And uh, so we're glad to have you back this evening. It's uh, right on 7, and so we want to get underway. Now, how many of you actually received a flyer like this at some point or still have it? Okay, if you flip it over on the other side, you see there's even more color. And on the other side, it says Celebrating Life and Recovery. Come join us, 14 weeks. That's every Wednesday starting on the 22nd of July, which I think is next week, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, what that's about, you, you've heard Cherie speak about that over the weekend, and uh, so we just want to put it on your radar screen. I'm going to embarrass someone and ask Wendy to stand up. Uh, Wendy is our coordinating the, the, this program for us, and so if you are uh, keen on joining this friendship group that will, be, that will be available to you for 14 weeks with its sole purpose just to hear you, surround you with support, and help you on that journey then please speak to Wendy so that she can collect the names uh, and contact information for those who want to be a part of that. So we're going to be starting that very soon, hot on the heels of this, so we keep the momentum going. And uh, we would love to be able to uh, be in that little uh, group with you to support you along the journey. The other thing is tonight after the meeting, there are refreshments that will be served down in the other warm room on the other end of the church over there. But uh, in the cold room right at the back, <laughs> we're going to set up a little table there and it'll have some of Cherie's resources, the DVDs, the books, and the like. And so uh, there will be somebody manning that table there for you and you'll be able to pick up some of those resources also. So I think that's about all I need to uh, tell you about this evening before Cherie takes, uh, takes it away. Now where has she gone? There she is. Come up, Cherie. I was just disappearing on you. Yeah, I was a bit worried about that. <laughs> so, one or two questions, <coughs> yes. uh, just to uh, help us get to know you a little bit better. Uh, I picked up, while we were talking with some people on the weekend, that you have uh, an interesting way to just find some release and relaxation. Your, your, <laughs> your husband... Your husband built you something. I can't, I can't even tell you. You cannot say that to an addict because my mind went to a thousand <laughs> different places. So, so what are you talking about? I'm talking about in recovery. I'm talking about no, now. No, I was thinking in recovery. Uh, not necessarily stuff I'd like to share with you. But, Your husband um, built you something. Oh, 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 oh. Um, I, I did a lot of my healing through the arts, and my husband just built me an art studio. And it was so fun to watch him because I came home one time and he had this beautiful studio built. And I love art, arts. I love drawing and watercolors and all that stuff. And I find a lot of healing there. He's a musician, so he kind of gets that. And I have a girlfriend in Australia that she said she, she got me a uh, drafting table and I had it shipped to my house. And I said, are you kidding me? And she said, every time you look at it, I want you to know that I love you. And so I think it sometimes we forget in our recovery to find out what makes us laugh, what makes us smile, what makes us um, literally take a breath and, and do some healing. And for me, the arts is that. Awesome. Um, and I have, he, my husband is so fun. When I walked in and cried like a baby, and he, of course, um, um, it was just wonderful for him too. It was fun. Right. Now, um, tonight, maybe you're already going to cover this, but you've mentioned a few times this area of religious addiction. And that's got me intrigued, because mm -hmm. I'm a pastor, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's got to have me worried. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so what do you mean by that? Now, if you're going to unpack that tonight, then don't yeah. answer it right Raise now. Raise your hand if you know a religious addict. <laughs> so we are going to unpack it tonight. Are they talking about me? Yeah, <laughs> No, religious addiction, sometimes if you do something addictively, regardless of what it is, and sometimes religious addicts, you'll know them because you'll see their phone number on your phone and you're like, I'm not getting that. <laughs> I'm not answering that. And so it's somebody that literally you feel beat up by their religion. You, be, you feel beat up by what they share with you. Um, and even their children are all running from them. A lot of times they just, they don't want anything to do with religion because even the rules are done, even though the words are right, 
It's very harsh. The standards are intense. And they've done studies with religious addicts and drug addicts, and their children have the same behavioral issues because the, 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 the rules and not, not ever being able to live up or, or not ever being able to know what is right, what behaviorally what is um, okay and what's not okay, inconsistencies as far as how people respond to them. And it's religious addicts. Um, what's hard is all the words are right but the behaviors are wrong. And, and you kind of can feel it. When you, somebody says, the joy of the Lord is your strength, and you're thinking, you got to memorize that scripture. <laughs> so you'll know that sometimes it's a religious addict. And if you are one, and I'm not going to point anyone else out, but um, if you are one, what's really incredible is to let God heal you. Because any addiction will get in your way. If you are into religion, but you feel angry like nobody else is hearing you, um, that, you're, that, that um, um, they're just not getting it or all that kind of stuff, if you walk around more in that sense, it's more than likely you're doing religious religion addictively. And, and, and let the Holy Spirit heal you. And tonight, let's cover some of that. If you are a religious addict, I want you to know that I want to kiss you on the face because the person that brought me to Christ was kind of a religious religious addict, but in her healing, um, she is amazing. So let me bait you a little bit or play devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so the real solution to that is we should just abolish all religion, right? I mean, if we got rid of religion... Or all addictions. Right. Because <laughs> you know what? Um, God is amazing. And so it's, it's, you know, when we do anything, I, you know, I can do anything addictively. And so sometimes I can go through my, from my pain to my hurt and I find God. And all of a sudden, rather than finding God and surrendering all that stuff, I start to put all my addictions on what I learned um, uh, religiously. I eat exactly what I'm supposed to eat and I do exactly what I'm supposed to do. And I, I say this exactly how it's supposed to be. Saying, and what do you mean, why, why aren't you doing that? And so then, you know, then you have a really kind of the perfect storm for a religious addict. Um, but, you, but I think abolish addictions, not religion. Awesome. So. Let me pray with you, Sheree. All right. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege we have of uh, being here this evening. Uh, we thank you that you brought Sheree to us. And I just ask that you'll bless every word, every thought, every sentiment. Um, bless her entire being. And uh, as we are here, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to understand, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about the addictive personality. And i got to say what's really fun, who wasn't here for uh, Friday or yesterday? Oh, a lot of people. So let me just say a few things. Um, um, uh, my name is Cherie. I have a television show called Celebrating Life and Recovery. It's been on for 11 years. It's worldwide on a couple networks. And my passion is um, walking people into a place of freedom from addiction. I used to think that was only drugs. Um, um, what I learned is it's not. But that is my passion. And I have, um, we're developing a children's program called Celebrating Life and Recovery Skips to Jesus. We have an adult program, a 14-week program that they're going to run in this church called Celebrating Life, um, um, the Steps to Christ Recovery Edition. And so everything I do kind of is around that. I have a horse ranch um, with horses for kids that are homeless or their parents are in and out of prison and rehab. So I even do that kind of on my spare time. Um, um, so it, it really is my passion. I, I'm a heroin addict in recovery. I was um, strung out for 10 years. I also was homeless in Los Angeles for those 10 years, from 13 um, to 23. And when I say homeless in LA, and for some of you that were, are, were here, is right now, today, there are about 80,000 homeless kids in Los Angeles. When they end up on the streets, they're funneled into a $32 billion industry. So what they see on the streets is pretty dark on top of their addictions, on top of their abuses. So, so even um, for me, one city in the world, um, there's an issue. But I have traveled, I've almost been to every country, and I've seen um, um, addiction and homelessness and abuse and all that kind of stuff in different forms, in different countries, in different cultures. And so um, it is my passion. And so I wanted tonight to start out with, um, I got to introduce you a little bit to my family. And I told you a little bit, you know, my... Um, uh, my dad died in a crack house. He was strung out. And my mom um, fell in love with this bartender who was amazing, funny guy, 
I'm a really funny guy. Um, but he was always using, smoking weed and drinking and all that kind of stuff. And so for most addicts, you're kind of up and down in all of that kind of stuff. So I got into my recovery at 23. We've talked about that before. So 23 years old, I get into recovery, step into that, and I am um, every day grateful. You know, I've now had uh, 35 years of clean time, which is incredible to me. Um, but in my clean time, I go home to visit, and my sister's a stripper, has a porn site, my other sister's making pee in my mom's garage, um, my brother's alcoholic, um, my mom's boyfriend, or who I call my dad, is smoking weed and like, you want some of this? <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, I'm in recovery. But at one point, there was a kind of an interesting thing happening is my dad, who, my stepdad, my mom's boyfriend, um, um, who I love, his favorite thing is to smoke weed and barbecue. Because a lot of times, when you smoke a lot of weed, you get the munchies, right? So for him, that is a great day. Have a football game on, have some pot, and have something on the grill, right? But over the years, everything is shut down. Um, on him. His liver, he is, he is pretty tall, but he's like just uh, skin and bones other than his liver. And he's got emphysema really bad. So he can't walk from maybe here to you without kind of resting. I told him one time, I said, you know, you should get some oxygen. And he said, how stupid would that look? And I'm thinking, it looks pretty stupid that you can't breathe, you know? <laughs> but, you know, it's like, he's he just that guy. He's so, he, he just, you know, and so one day he's going out to barbecue. He's been smoking weed, and, and he's just having a great time. And he lights the grill. And the fire from the grill takes the oxygen away from his face just a little, but it's enough that he passes out. So he hits his head on the cement around the grill and knocks himself out. My dad is very bright, so when he wakes up, he says, maybe I'm too stoned to barbecue. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he goes to bed. And, and I, this is a story. I don't mean to laugh at this story because it's tragic, but I mean, I couldn't even hardly stand it. So anyhow, he goes to bed. My mom, who hasn't slept with him, I don't know in how long, um, because uh, does anybody know that sometimes when your body shuts down to that extent that you're impotent? Anybody get that part of it? So um, um, impotency in a lot of countries um, is pretty high because people's drinking and drug use and whatever. Viagra is popular because people can't actually perform um, at this point. But anyhow, so my dad was like that. So my mom and dad are, are, sleep separately. But my mom knows that he has to drink every two hours else he gets shakes so bad that he can't even hold a toothbrush or a glass. Anybody know an alcoholic to that extent? So, I mean, he has to drink, and so she knows, but she hasn't seen him for hours. So she goes in the room just to see, okay, what's off with you? I haven't seen you for a long time. She goes in, and she just shakes him, and she's like, no way. Did you die on me? <laughs> and she is so angry, like, you, na, 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 I knew. I knew that one of these days that I'm going to come in. And she just screamed and yelled. Pretty soon my younger sister walks in, right? And my younger sister's a pee addict. What's up? What, what's, what's wrong with dad, you know? And she's shaking him. And so now they're all like, come on. And she lifts his arm up and it falls like a rag doll. She's like, man. So they're all screaming at him. A few hours later, they call an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> I always think a few hours, you know, I had a call one right away. I said, why don't you call one right away? Now, well, you know how your dad is. <laughs> Not when he's dead, right? So anyhow, so they call an ambulance. And my dad says, this is his take on that whole thing. He said, I'm laying in bed. I'm hearing everybody scream around me, and I'm trying to move anything. And I couldn't move a thing. I couldn't wiggle my toes. And I'm inside screaming, I'm not dead! <laughs> I'm not dead! And he said, nothing. I couldn't blink my eyes. I couldn't wiggle my toes. I couldn't move anything. But he hasn't drank now for about 12 hours. Could you imagine his withdrawals? He is delusional. He is 
massive. When you have drank most of your life and you cannot go a, a couple hours without having tremors and you haven't drank for 12 hours, he is crazy inside. He feels that snakes are all over him, that worms are crawling in and out of him, and he can't move a muscle. And he is screaming inside. When my mom finally calls the ambulance, the ambulance shows up, my dad is under the impression that he's being abducted by aliens. <laughs> and you know what aliens do to you when they abduct you? Anybody raise your hand if you've seen that special? So he's like, they're going to take me and they're going to do like these sexual experiments or something and he's trying to move his toes. He said, I can't even move my toes and they're putting him on the gurney and they're wheeling him out and he is trying to scream. They're stealing me. They are not really who they look like they are. And he gets to the hospital. My mom and sister are with him in the hospital. He is crazy as, but not able to move anything. And do you think that my mom and sister said, you know what, he's alcoholic. You might want to check that. <laughs> Anybody think they, that's what they said? Why not? You don't talk family business. Do you know what I mean? So my, they said nothing. <laughs> just dropped him off, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it took the doctors a while to um, realize that he is really in trouble. By that time, they call me. I'm already in recovery, been in recovery for a long time. I love them, but I'm serious. They are um, interesting lot. And so they call me and they say, you know what, we don't think he's going to survive. And I'm, I, I, my heart broke, because you know, when somebody is lost in their addiction and you've never got to say you love them, you've talked through the drug the entire life, is my sadness is he's going to die and I'm never going to talk to anything but this alcohol. But anyhow, I raised some money, um, flew in. It took me a, a, a bit to raise the money and fly into town. I'm in LAX. I get a rent a car and go to my mom's house and, and, and I, I, I'm so sad. I just want to go and I just want to um, go to the hospital and kind of hang out with my dad before he dies, right? My stepdad or whatever. But um, so I, I go in the house and, and I come in and he is sitting there. Hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? What are you doing here? Because I thought he's in the hospital. I thought he's dying. He is sitting there on a recliner that he has sat in for the last 35 years. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like the shape of their body. It's their chair. It's got all their paraphernalia on both sides. You know, I mean, he's got everything he needs all by this recliner, and it is his. He can sit there on tables on both sides. He's got an ashtray as big as Texas because he can't hardly breathe to get up and empty it. So he's just got this big one. He's got his beer there. He's got um, everything he needs remote control, all that stuff. In the recline, excuse me, in the recliner, the arms have these big kind of puffy arms and they open up and there's compartments there. What do you think is in my dad's <laughs> recliner? He's got roach clips and lighters and papers, you know, because then he used to roll more than that. Anyhow, so he's got all that stuff. And, and, and what was really funny is on the other side in his recliner, when you open it up, it's catnip for our cats. <laughs> Does anybody know what catnip is? It's like weed for cats, right? So even, I'm serious, even our cats are stoned. When my mom on her, <laughs> on her Facebook page, I hate to say this because she gets mad at me, but on her Facebook page is a beautiful Siamese cat with a, a, a sprig of catnip in front of it, and it can't lift its head off the table because he's so stoned. Right? And they think that's very funny. So anyhow, so that's my family. So I said, what are you doing? And he said, man, they took me to the hospital, and, and they found out that my arteries in my neck were, like, blocked off. And I, and, and I thought, wow, because what do you think you need those arteries for? <laughs> <laughs> and even as a teenager, I think, I think they were blocked off way back then, you know. But anyhow, so they, they took this little thing and they cleaned out the arteries in his neck. He's got a little Band-Aid on his neck. That's it. I think they'd have to cut your head off to fix that stuff. But they literally have this little Band-Aid. So they clean out those arteries. And he's like, I feel better than I've ever felt in my life. <laughs> and he just, and I'm, I'm looking at him like, I love you. 
But man, if that happened to me, I'd be slamming carrot juice. You know what I mean? And he's like, "Hon, you just can't worry about every little thing. <laughs> and so he's just, he's home. He's, he's thrilled. He had a subdural hematoma when he fell and he hit his head. He had a slow bleed causing paralysis. They dealt with they dealt with all that. And, um, and so he's telling me all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm looking at him as he's smoking weed and he's drinking his beer. And he's in the same house. In our house, the, the blinds are shut. There's no light. I mean, the, the house is filthy. Child Protective Services used to come to remove us as kids as much as they could because addicts don't take care of a lot of that stuff. And I'm thinking he almost died. And he didn't drop a beat, right? And he starts smiling. I said, what? And he's smiling like a kid that just got ice cream. And I'm like, what? You know? And he's like, nothing. And I'm like, what? And he's like, well. <laughs> and he reached over to the coffee table and he pulled up a bottle of pain meds. Look what they gave me at the hospital. <laughs> and he was thrilled. Now he has pain meds and pot and alcohol. And in our family, it is really interesting, the, the amount of abuse. Um, and the amount of abuse and everybody, this is normal, you know. Um, it's really abnormal. Like when I show up for Christmas and I'm clean, they're like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm saying? You walk in and they're like, okay, hide the drugs. <laughs> you know? So, but, um, and, and what's really funny is when you have somebody clean that shows up in the family, all of a sudden what used to be done in the living room at our house is done in the garage. Like my dad will look at my brother and say, just got a new transmission, want to see it? <laughs> They don't know a thing about cars. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they go out and do some lines and smoke some weed, and then they come back in. So um, that is my family. So when I talk about addictions, I don't want to talk about addictions and shame anybody. What I want to talk about is addictions will always take you out. And they always separate you from the people that love you, and they will always, always shut you off from everyone. When my dad... Um, um, struggles with all that kind of stuff. When my real dad died, no one ever knew who he was. They knew what his addictions were. They knew that he was unsafe. But I don't have any idea who he is. He died on crack, died molesting kids. So we're going to talk about addictive personality. I'm going to talk about it. If, if anybody has any questions, um, can you save the questions until we're done? Because we're going to leave plenty of time for questions, and we'll talk about that. But I want to go through addictions. What is addiction? What is addictive personality? There are three kinds of highs in the world, and everybody is going to seek after one of these kinds of highs. So find yourself, if you're an addict, religious addict, workaholic, whatever, what category do you fall in? And we'll talk about uh, specifics at the end. But I'm going to go through quickly kind of what is addictions, what the root cause of addictions are, no matter what it is, and what the highs are, and then we'll talk. And, and what's really interesting with I'm supposed to be doing something? Do something with my computer? Um, like? <laughs> I'll let the pastor do something. <laughs> So even with addictions, what we're going to talk about is compulsive behavior, understanding the addictive process, and we're going to look at it in uh, some research. The guy that I pull from a lot is a guy named Nakin. He's an amazing, brilliant guy as far as in, um, um, in addiction. So I'm going to pull a lot from him. I've gotten his permission for people that worry about that kind of stuff. And then we're going to um, look at um, what is it. When somebody talks about addiction, it, it, you know, is it a moral weakness? Is it a lack of willpower? You know, what is it exactly? And so there's a number of people that have um, um, kind of labeled it is this or it's that or it's whatever. And I want you to kind of put all of that aside for a moment. If you've done um, your own work or if you're working with addicts in the community, put everything you know aside and just give me a moment um, to have you relook at it. And we're going to relook at it tonight, maybe. Uh, I think he's close. <laughs> you know, and what's really interesting to me is you'd think that I should learn how to do this. <laughs> but I would say... Is 
Is it working? <coughs> Not yet. Show me the next slide and I'll go on. And then you can, um, um, you can work on this and I'll just go on. So addiction um, ha has been, like over the years, like a lack of will, to, a, a lack of willpower, inability to face the world, like somebody says with addicts, is that you really, um, it's that they just can't cope, they just can't um, face reality, all that kind of stuff. Again, I'm going to ask you to put that aside. All of that, on some level, is true, but in, in, in uh, what I want you to think about is when we are born, we're born um, um, with an expectation that our needs are going to be met. Right? So I really am looking for our needs to be met. I'm looking for happiness. I want to be okay in my own skin. And we're all born with that. And most life has this up and down thing, right? Some days are great. Some days are not. Some days are so-so. Um, for some folks, that's okay, not for an addict. If it's great, I want it to be better, right? And if it's bad, it's a catastrophe. And so at one point in my life, I try to control these natural cycles, right? And it, and it could be at any age, but the, the second that I try to control that and I find something that helps me to control that, I've started the addictive process. And so we're going to go into that kind of stuff. So the natural cycles, just trying to find um, a way to fit in, kind of... Um, um, uh, literally, a way to fit in, a way to be happy, a way to be okay in my own skin. So addiction says it can be uh, viewed as an attempt to control those cycles. Can you guys see that? Control those cycles. On its most basic level, it's an attempt to control and fulfill the desire to be happy. And, and raise your hand if you understand that, if you've ever been an addict right? I just want to feel good. I just want to laugh out loud. I just don't want to be stressed. I mean, all that kind of stuff. So basically, it is for all of us, regardless of what the addiction is, we want to actually um, feel better. Addiction is progressive, undergoes continuous change. Addiction will never be the same today as it is five years from now or ten years from now. So, so one thing is really clear about addiction is it always is progressive. Um, you know, if I have an eating disorder, man, a little bowl of ice cream works for a while. <laughs> But you know, after a while, it's a gallon of ice cream. I have a friend that can ha eat $250 worth of food in one setting and just continuously throw it up and eat some more. So addiction, regardless of what the addiction is, is always progressive. Um, and so you've got to know that. If you're a, sexual, a sex addict and, and you do like online stuff, um, be careful, because what works today is not what works next year or five years from now. And a lot of people, even in this room, will know exactly what I'm saying, and it will rob you. Um, this is my favorite. Addiction is a pathological love-trust relationship with an object or an event. Remember when I said, when I was 11 years old, um, and this was after a couple of suicide attempts, but 11 years old, I took my first drug, and 27 minutes later, I didn't feel like killing myself. I fell in love. Man, I may not be able to trust you, but I trust this drug. I may not be able to feel safe anywhere else, but when I'm high, I feel safe. I don't even feel like killing you when I'm high, which is good for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's like it's being able to then start looking at this drug or this thing as a solution to my issues. And pretty soon, if you get in my way of this drug, I literally can discard you. So I start to push away real relationships, and my relationship becomes with this drug or with this addiction, or with work, or education, or religion, or whatever, whatever it is. But I, I literally am looking to control something, and I'm using an object or an event to do that. So I'm actually looking for a mood change. I don't like this mood I'm in. I don't like feeling lost and unwanted and unsure or suicidal. But man, the mood change I get with the drug is huge. So most addictions, we're looking for a mood change. Alcoholics, um, you know, alcoholic, it's, it's not so much the drink, but the entire event. I'm with my mates, 
You know, I'm hanging out with, with my friends. We're laughing, we're joking, whatever. And the mood change that happens in the environment is enough to help me with all the other stuff. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about alcoholic in recovery. So there's a guy in recovery. He decides not to drink, right? But man, he's being, he's not, his bills are, are, are not being paid. He's, he's having a hard time at work. His wife is on his case. He, he's been not drinking and I'm white knuckling it and I just want a break, you know? And the boss gets on my case. And, and I, I literally had the boss come up and he's on my case and he's just in my face. And pretty soon I say, you know what? In just in my head, on Friday, I'm going to go get off my face. So you say what you want to say. Just give it your best shot. So, but in my mind, that's what I'm saying. So when do I start feeling better as an alcoholic that's going to be relapsing? When, do, when does my mood change? Does it change Friday or right when I said, say what you want? Friday, I'm going to be off my face. So as soon as I decide to relapse... As soon as I decide to grab that relationship again, I start to feel better. The mood change happens, and I haven't had a drink. Thursday, the boss is in my face again. I'm good, because Friday, I'm going to be off my face, right? So even on Thursday, I feel better. Friday, when I take the first drink, of course, now I'm in a full-blown relapse. But the, the, the mood change happens in my head, and behaviorally, long before I act out, long before I grab the drink, right? So know that if you understand that the mood change is what I'm after, the addiction is not necessarily the issue. I couldn't say on Friday, I'm going to go get a gallon of milk. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, it, it really has to be an addictive substance. But I feel better immediately, and I'm looking for a mood change. Alcoholics, they get the mood change with alcohol. But they also get the mood change initially with hanging out with friends, with going to the pub, with doing all that kind of stuff. In the end of an alcoholic's life, they're hiding alcohol um, around the house, and they're drinking by themselves, and it's not the same. Um, I remember, remember when I told you that my favorite uncle was so yellow because his liver was shutting down um, that as a kid he told me that his mama was a duck. Um, but I mean, he was yellow, skin, eyes, everything, and he was drinking by himself. But so I'm talking about initially, in the initial part of um, your alcoholism, the mood change is going to be all of it. Um, food addicts. Anybody have no food addicts? You could be feeling horrible. And you'd say, you know what? I'm just going to go get some ice cream. <laughs> I'm just going to go get a pizza. I'm just going to go. And as soon as you say that, you start to feel better. You know, you know, I used to think, you know, just give me a little bowl of ice cream. But I think, just give me a spoon. <laughs> you know? Do you know? So, you know, and it doesn't work. It's like, I'm going to go get me a bag of apples. I mean, it, doesn't, it has to be stuff that is, you know, sugar and, or cheese or, or, or savory stuff. So, but we can... We can literally get a mood change by the amount of food that we eat or don't eat. Some people starve themselves to, get to death and they get the mood change in that way. But it's like food is the same thing. As soon as I feel bad, bad as soon as I feel stressed, if I just go grab something in the fridge. Um, raise your hand if I'm making sense. Okay, good. So if I go grab something in the fridge, I literally can mood change. It's not the food that I'm looking for. I'm looking for the mood change and the food gives it to me. So just know that it's the mood change I'm looking for. Um, I have a friend that when she goes over to your house, if I, you and I were friends, I would know exactly where you put your food because I'm a food addict. Do you know what I mean? If, if I, I go to different stores so people don't see the amount of food that I buy because I'm ashamed of that. So I mean, we start to do it addictively to the point of um, um, that we are doing like any addict, we're hiding stuff, we're not telling people how much we're eating. Who's got candy wrappers in different parts of the car? <laughs> you know, all of that kind of stuff. We start doing all that kind of stuff, but we're looking for the mood change. It not necessarily is the food, but the food works. And the food works because sugar and the biochemical happens in our body with the amount of food that we take in or the types of food. There's changes that are addictive. If we starve ourselves to death, it's the same thing. Your body starts show, uh, shooting off chemicals that are addictive. And so you, whether you starve or you binge, um, you get a mood change. Um, 
Um, and, and food is a kind of a dangerous way to do it because it's, it's hard to, um, um, you really have to in your recovery, you have to eat. Um, and it's hard to, like I don't have to hang out with heroin addicts. So it's easier for me not to go um, buy heroin, but you have to buy dinner. You know, so it is a little tougher in recovery. Um, gamblers, I love gamblers. Because gamblers, you know, the changes that happen, like if I, th I think, you know what, I'm just going to go bet on a game. Who, who's the team that you would bet on? All blacks, right? I have a thousand bucks and they're going to win, right? So I'm going to bet on the game and I put it down. And you just feel like the guy when you can do that or the girl, whatever. I feel there's a power that comes from man, you know what, and I know every player. I know the stats. I know the history. I know all that kind of stuff. Am I going to watch the game? Absolutely. I'm right there. If the ref makes a bad call, you are throwing stuff. <laughs> You know what I mean? But I'm fully alive in my own skin. The mood change happened. I don't care what's happening in the rest of my life. I don't care what my wife and kids are saying or my husband's saying. I don't even care what my boss is saying. Right now, I'm watching the game. And I get the mood change. Everything that I am dealing with goes away until they lose, <laughs> if they lose. I mean, they may not have ever lost, but then they, they lose and my thousand bucks is gone and I have to look at my spouse saying, well, you know, I thought it was a sure thing. But with, with gambling, the mood change that happens with gambling, and you may even say in your head, man, I, I, I'm not going to gamble just for a couple of weeks. I'm not, I, you put it on for the next month. But then you read something in the paper and you think, wow, that's a sure bet. <laughs> and then you're off and running again because of the mood change, not necessarily because of the win or lose. If, if it was the win or lose in gambling, as soon as you win, you'd be done. Um, but like anything, when I eat ice cream, how long does that taste stay in my mouth? Minutes. Um, when I do a bet, when I watch a game, the next game has to happen because that feeling doesn't last. So I have to do the next thing. So gambling is the same. Very, gambling is a very powerful addiction because you, you do, uh, there's a presence that happens, whether it's a sport, watching a sport, playing um, um, slots or, or whatever. There's, there's something that happens that's very empowering, and we're going to get into that. But it's, it's an addiction that is as serious as any chemical addiction, and neurochemically what happens in your head is huge. But know that you're looking for a mood change. And, and, and stay with me on this because it's powerful to learn what to do with these addictions. Um, shoplifters, raise your hand if you're out there. <laughs> so I picked a girl one time out of a group, just as an example, and she said, I stole everything that I have on. So you don't have to disclose much. <laughs> But with, with shoplifters, let me just find somebody as an example. Um, let me find it. I just want to get a sense of who would steal something in this group. <laughs> would you? She's like, no, I would not. She's like, don't even. Um, come on up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow me up. And not that she would, but just look how innocent she looks. She could get away with it, right? Because you look so sweet. So, I'm looking at shoplifters. Do you think she would make a good shoplifter? Why not? They have no faith in you. <laughs> Do you think she would? She'd be, she'd, but you know what? I think it's because she doesn't have a lot of place to hide things, you know? And so to me, a good shoplifter literally has jackets on and a backpack and all that kind of stuff. She could maybe put a couple pairs of pants on, and I don't want to give you any suggestions. <laughs> Thank well, you. I do have pants on. Oh, you do have pants on, so she could do this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so... <laughs> But anyway, so with a shoplifter, long before they steal something, they plan to go to the store, right? Some people in the U.S., because that's where I'm from, will take baby carriages, you know, and they're putting something in diaper bags and they're putting things, you know, all, I mean, they've got just, they've got it planned out. So before they even go out, they've layered up, 
They've got stuff that they, if they steal, they can hide it. And they've thought about all that. So their adrenaline is going. They're present in their body for the first time. When they walk in to the store, what do you think they look for first? Cameras. So any cameras. It, who's, you look like kind of an average guy, but I bet you're store security. Do you know what I mean? So I'll watch you for a while, watching you watching me. Do you know what I mean? So you're fully alive. Your mood changes happen. You're not thinking about anything stressful. You're thinking about, am I going to get away with this? You know? And when you get everything that you want and you head for the door, that is a moment of truth. If I walk past that door, I could either be arrested or I could get to my car, right? So you're fully alive. Your heart's pounding. The mood changes happen. And for shoplifters, um, a lot of mental health issues, depression and some of those things, shoplifting um, is a part of that. The last, last church I went to, it was crazy, a normal church. And this woman comes up, and she was beautiful. Like, stand up for a minute. The, the blue, yeah. She comes up, and she says, I steal every time I go to the store. <laughs> so go ahead and sit down. But she looked normal. And I'm thinking, how do I stay? Like, I want to not laugh, but I think, no way. You know, I'd expect that from somebody like me that's a druggie. I couldn't even let the offering plate go by without wanting to steal something. But, you know, for somebody that just looked normal, I was shocked. And she said, I, I, you know, it's nothing. It's little things. But it's that, that sense of... Um, her heart pounding and that sense of, you know, being present. And, and I think she felt so disconnected in most of her life as that moment gave her a connection that she didn't get anywhere else. And the love-trust relationship happens for her, that she knows in that moment, at least um, I'm present. Cutters feel the same way. So I was really surprised when she said, I don't want to say it up front because I don't want my, <laughs> my face to be posted at the store. But, but um, shoplifting is another mood change um, thing, but it's actually an addiction. Um, sex addict, same kind of thing, is that um, uh, there's a, a guy in recovery. He's in recovery. He gets disrespected from his wife. They start having some major issues. And sex addicts are for men and women are different. I could use a woman, but I would have to use a whole different story because we do our addictions really differently. But this guy um, starts having some struggles, starts having some marital stuff fall apart. He's, just, he's going to groups, and he's got a sponsor and all that stuff. But he's really having a hard time. And one day he decides, and Instead of going straight home, he's going to go to the store and get a Coke or a Pepsi. So he goes to the store, right next to the Coke or Pepsi is some porn magazines. He says, I might as well get a magazine while I drink my Pepsi. I can look at something. And then pretty soon, by the end of the night, he's acted out in every way possible. And then he calls his sponsor. <laughs> you know, raise your hand if you're a sex addict. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Call your sponsor sooner. And, but anyhow, so this guy finally calls his sponsor. Sponsor says, go to group. So the next day he goes to group, tells the story. And the group has heard this Pepsi story over and over. And finally the group says, stop drinking Pepsi. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because every time you act out, every time you want a mood change, the first thing you do is you go get a Pepsi. And then everything follows that. So the mood change for most of it happens in a predictable pattern. But um, th by the time this guy acts out, out, um, he's already um, fully engaged in his addiction. So if he learns to start paying attention to what starts the mood change, he actually has an easier time at recovery. Um, but no, he uses sex for the mood change. Um, um, but usually what triggers a mood change is not his need for sex. Do you hear what I'm saying? What triggers my mood change to go to the refrigerator is not my need for ice cream. When I go out and do whatever, it's not my need for that thing, is I want a mood change. I don't want to feel like this. Um, this one, next one, I don't want to step on anyone's toes. <laughs> but raise your hand if you're a shopaholic. If you're married to one, raise their hand. <laughs> so, so anyway, shopaholics, it's really fun. Because if I'm feeling bad, I'm just going to go get a new outfit. You know what I mean? Um, and, and literally, as a shopaholic, I can go, I, I get up, I get dressed, I do my hair, I go to the mall, I buy a couple things, and I come home and put them in a drawer or hang them up. I may never wear them, right? Hey, raise your hand if you have something in your house with the price tag still on it. <laughs> 
So you know what I'm saying. So with a shopaholic, I could tell by your credit cards and the fact that it's not about what you buy. It's I want that mood change. Um, in, the, in the U.S., when the economy goes south, which has happened quite a bit, um, um, but when the economy goes south, lipstick sales go up. Because if I can't buy a lot, at least I can buy some lipstick. Do you know what I mean? And they actually have done a study, and it, there's a correlation there. So it's like our spending habits. We spend to feel better. I, you know, if I, if I looked better, maybe I'll feel better. I'll just get another outfit. I'll just whatever. And, and, and I'm looking for the mood change, and I do that through shopping. And I don't want to discount any of these addictions. They're serious addictions. Um, but I just am laughing because I think we all have something, and I just want you to understand that whatever the addiction is, it's a mood change that we're looking for. Um, workaholics, raise your hand. <laughs> I love workaholics. I hire them because <laughs> I'm really lazy. No, no, I'm kidding. But my, my creative director is a workaholic, and after the next project, I'm going to have her work on that. Um, but what's really interesting is she can work herself. She could work 16 hours in a day, and you can say to her, man, i got to get this out by tomorrow. And she said, oh, just give it to me. No, I'm not doing anything, right? Not true. Um, but she can work herself to death. Um, there's a thing in, I think it's Japan. I wish I could know the name. If somebody wants the name, I'll bring it tomorrow. But in a book called Thrilled to Death, they talk about that if you are from this country and you die on the job and you can prove that you worked yourself to death, your widow gets more money on her, on her uh, pension because they really value that. But I mean, they work, they, you have to prove that you, do, you, you literally worked yourself to death. And there's a word for that. And when I read that, I thought, oh, shut up, there's no way. But you know, somebody said it absolutely is true. So we value in a lot of places, we value workaholics. Um, we hire them in churches, we hire them in businesses, I hire them in the small business that I have. I mean, we hire them because they do a great job, they're usually good at what they do, and they get their mood change and their affect affirmation by the projects that they do, right? And one more project. And, and it's enough for some folks, for someone to say, great job. Man, I can really rely on you. I could trust you with anything. And that's enough. But their whole families usually have fallen apart. Um, when my creative director started working on her issues. Um, I met her son, who's an alcoholic, drug addict. I met her other daughter, who's suicidal, and her husband that feels like they're so disconnected and have been for the last 20 years. So now that they're working on that issue, I realize that workaholism is as serious as most other addictions. What is nice about a workaholic, if you are hiring them, is they'll get a lot done. What's not good about a workaholic is they're trading their life. Um, and so anything that you do for a mood change, whether it's a project, work, or whatever, um, will progressively get worse and, um, and deal with that. Because the fact that you're brilliant, Fran, the girl, that, the woman I work with, is brilliant. Um, but man, I want her around forever. And so she's got to deal with this issue or is dealing with this issue. Um, self mutilators is the same. And I can do a lot of different addictions, but I've just listed some of them. But a self-mutilator is that um, they literally will be present or get the mood change by setting up their whatever they use, whether they're headbangers, whether they burn themselves, whether they cut themselves, however they self-mutilate. I met an 83-year-old woman that just bit her nails all the way down till they bled, and she had to do that when, whenever she got stressed, she went through all... 10 fingers. Uh, so self-mutilators will mutilate, but the whole mood change starts when they decide they're going to cut or when they decide they're going to do that in everything that they set up. Um, I have a friend that um, um, cut herself, burned herself, head banged, and she started, it got progressively worse and pretty soon. She wrote a book called End All the Pain, amazing book. Um, but Vicki said that she started to cut and it didn't work anymore. Because remember, it's progressive. So she cuts more, she cuts deeper. Does anybody know a cutter? Pretty soon they're just cutting. Uh, I mean, you t you, they have long sleeves on usually. They've covered all that kind of stuff, but they're cutting. Your body will not produce the chemical it needs 
addictively unless you cut deeper or more frequently. And so, um, so Vicky started to burn. Um, then she started to say cigarettes and literally burn holes in her skin. And then she lit those up with lighter fluid um, and just lit her skin on fire. So she has gone through a progression of the self-injury and now she's in healing. But with a cutter, they're just looking to feel better. They don't feel seen, they feel numb, they feel whatever. A lot of people will have a number of different reasons why you do something, um, but it's usually the mood change and, and the wanting to, um, um, to not feel like what you're feeling like. Um, I'm going to now look at um, all these addictions and events are different, but they all produce that desired mood change. And, 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 and with the addict that, that steps in is for a moment... And sometimes it is a moment I feel better. You know, I talked with somebody the other night and said, you know what? Um, they get stressed and they finally go uh, binge and drink. And for a moment, they get relief. And then they trigger. They feel guilty. They, they want to, you know, they, they, all that kind of shame comes back and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes that mood change doesn't last long. It's just the moment. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we did this a little bit the other night. But... I want you to think about different kinds of cancers. So somebody tell me a cancer. Brain cancer, lung cancer. Skin, leukemia, breast cancer, prostate cancers, kidney cancers. Um, every single one looks different, right? Sometimes grossly different. But they all have uh, something in common, and that's a cell that's out of control, right? And so all cancers have one thing in common. All addictions have one thing in common. And we're going to go through a little bit of that. But I want to I wanna take you through um, the types of highs first. And so I want you to think about the types of highs that each addiction promises you, right? And the first one is an arousal high. Second one is a satiation high or saturation high. And the third one is a fantasy high, right? So um, the, the, each one of these highs are different. Somebody that's going to be attracted to the top one is not going to really be attracted much to the second one. So, so think about yourself or somebody you love. Arousal and saturation, or sat, uh, saturation highs are attractive, cunning, baffling, and they are powerful. These addictions are powerful. And so when I joke about, around about them and I'm up here saying all this kind of stuff, don't for a minute think I, I'm telling you that you can just do this on your own. Um, the reason reason why, why we're running a group and the reason why we're doing the education is most of us need each other in order to um, reconnect with people and disconnect with addictions. So, so I'm not saying that these are easy and these highs are not powerful because they really are. For an arousal high, arousal is amphetamines, cocaine, ecstasy, the first few drinks of alcohol, gambling, sexual acting out, spending, that kind of stuff. And so an arousal high is, is somebody that says, you know what? I want to be seen. You're not looking at me, excuse me, because I'm talking. You know what? And so they're right in your face. They're loud. When they come into the pub or they come into the room, you see them. You know, if you don't see them, you'll see them within a short period of time. They're like a puffer fish. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that you just know that they're there and they don't want to be quiet. I don't want to be quiet. What do you mean, shut up? You know, and so an arousal addict, um, there's a sensation of intense, raw, unchecked power, like the feeling that, you know what, I can take what I need. You know what, I'm looking for happiness, try to stand in my way. So an arousal addict will say, you know what, I'm not waiting for you to give me nothing. They, they actually may use different words, but, but I'm not waiting for you to give me something because I can take it. So that kind of person will literally try to control whatever their addiction is, and their addictions will be, um, allow them to be more um, out there, louder or aggressive or whatever. So they will not choose things that um, help them to disappear. They really want to be in your face. That speaks directly to the drive for power. Um, a lot of times, I met somebody one time that the, their stepfather bashed them most of their life. When he was 14 years old, stepfather came at him, but he realized at that time, wait a minute, I'm actually bigger than him right now. And he turned around and he bashed him, bashed his stepfather, and he said, no one will ever 
ever hurt me again. And so an arousal addict, literally at one point in their life, may have felt powerless, but not now. Not now. Don't get in my way. Um, Arousal, uh, they feel like they can achieve happiness, safety, and fulfillment. It gives them, uh, the addict, the, the feeling of omnipotence. Um, um, while it slowly or subtly drains away all their power. Do you hear what I'm saying? Has anybody been with somebody long enough that when they start yelling, everybody looks at each other like, whatever? You know what I'm saying? Because after a while, even your mama could care less that you're screaming. You know what I mean? Because it, it drains away all power. Pretty soon, um, you are literally powerless in the height of your addiction. You can c turn back to the drug or the gambling or whatever. Nobody's hearing you anymore and that kind of stuff. So it is a really sad thing towards the end of an addiction. Um, getting more power means returning to the object or the event, um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, eventually, you become dependent on the sexual thing, the drugs, the gambling, um, the amphetamines, whatever. If you get busted for amphetamines, let's say, or pee, um, what do you think you'll switch to if you have to drug test? Switch to alcohol. Can't drink, switch to sex. But you'll switch to stuff within that addiction right, within that high, um, um, because you can switch around, but you're not in recovery until you decide to step away from addictions um, and whatever kind of um, vein that they go to. You, you really have to look at all that kind of stuff, because a good addict will just bounce around, you know. Um, I, I've, now I'm going to talk about, this is my addiction, saturation or satiation um, addict. Um, that is um, a saturation addict um, feels um, they're attracted to things that will make them feel full or complete um, and beyond pain. Heroin, alcohol, marijuana, Valium, um, various things such as overeating, watching TV, slot machines, that kind of stuff. But I feel empty, so I'm going to fill up, right? So heroin, I can take, a, t take some heroin and I nod off for 12 hours. For 12 hours, I feel like I'm not in pain. For 12 hours, I get a break. So I don't care if I'm seen. In fact, a, a, a saturation addict really doesn't look to be seen. They look to be out of pain. They want to be numb. They want to not hurt, um, that kind of thing. So Valium, prescription drugs, um, a movie, a good novel, um, slot machines, uh, because it's different than gambling. Gambling, like if I'm going to do 21 or I'm going to watch games or whatever, is very out there or loud. But a slot machine, I could just do a lever or push a button for eight, nine hours. Um, and I could disappear in that. So this kind of addict really wants to disappear. Doesn't want to feel pain. Um, saturation high is attractive to certain types of addicts because it numbs the sensation of pain. And that's what this addict is looking for. And distress. Um, the next one is an interesting one. And it, it, it kind of, this one will combine with the other one somewhat. But a fantasy or trance addict, they don't really care if they're seen. Do you know what I mean? And they don't really care if they disappear. I mean, it's not about that for them. They don't even know who they are. They're like, you know what? I, I, you know, I, I put one mask on after another mask on after another mask on, and I really don't know. Somebody says, just be yourself. Has anybody ever felt somebody say that and you just want to cry because you think, I don't know who that is, you know? Um, I can, uh, you know, somebody says, I have four PhDs or four masters, and I think, well, I'm looking at a fantasy or trance addict. You, you can't educate yourself into your own skin. And, I, and I'm not saying that if you have four PhDs, don't take it personal. But, you know, so, you know with some people, they'll educate themselves to death or they'll, 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 they'll put on different masks and they'll be whatever somebody wants them to be. They're very adaptable in situations. They can change wherever they're at. Um, but they really, underneath all of that, is a, they, they have lived in this fantasy or trance state as a way to do a mood change. And they may have done that their whole life. Fran, the workaholic that... Um, works in our organization, she says, I can, I can sense when I was a kid when I put on my first mask. And I thought, man, she was invited to the prom. 
right? And she was in love. But she said, I didn't, I was, I was kind of the nerdy kid, the intellectual kid, and, and when, so this was my first boyfriend. And, and then her roommate ended up going to band camp with her boyfriend. They fell in love. They came back and said, you know, we're going to go to the prom together, and sorry, you know. And Fran said the first thing she thought is, Oh, how funny is that? Because I actually am running the prom. So you guys just get to dance. I get to run the place. I did the graphics. I did the decorations. But she never felt the pain of that. Her first mass went on. She was overachieving. And so to me, it's the, it's, it's the fantasy allows you to kind of get out of all of that kind of stuff and be something else or someone else. Um, the trance state is a state of detachment, a state of separation from one's physical surroundings. With a the trance or fantasy, it's, um, some people call it dissociative disorders, or like I'm just going to detach almost completely, and I will be whatever. And, and so this, this kind of addict, what's really incredible to me, to, or this kind of person that chooses this um, escape, is what's amazing is to be able to work with them through um, finding out who they are. Because most of us have incredible talents, incredible things to offer, and it's amazing for me to work with someone like this. But it's a tough one because it's fearful to take mask off. What's going to be underneath that? Some, some trance addicts or some people that are disassociative is they have a deep sense of shame about who they are, not what they've done. There's something desperately wrong with who I am. And it's not true, but they believe it with everything in them. And so they put another mask on and another mask on and another mask on. So to convince them that you can take the mask off and they actually will discover that you are... Um, Incredible. I mean, most of us have incredible talents. Uh, the trance allows the addict to detach from the pain and guilt and shame they feel, and it makes it extremely attractive. They feel about who they are, not what they've done. With, with me, my mom tried to self-abort when she had me. She was a kid, right? Tried to self-abort six different times. I was born into a family of addicts, and the only thing I knew most of my life is I've never bonded with anyone. I was never held by my mom, and I always felt that something was desperately wrong with me, right? Now I'm strung out on the streets. I'm illiterate at 23 years old, and I had to start taking masks off at that time. Man, I actually am not unworthy, unlovable, I'm not stupid. You know, I've literally got to see that kind of stuff, but my whole life I believe one thing, and I just would put one mask on after another after another. And so, um, you know, it's a really interesting thing to trust recovery enough to start taking those off. The addict views the trance state as a solution to all their problems. If I can just be what you want me to be, you'll like me. Um, it's not true. Because if you're not being yourself, it's not tangible enough for anyone to hold on to. Um, so your relationships are not real enough. Um, when you take your mask off, you, your relationships become more real. So addiction takes and takes and takes some more. It never stops until someone says, hey, how about recovery? How about recovery? And it's amazing to me, the only way, and we talked about this yesterday, the only way to do recovery, honestly, is start to connect with people. And we're going to go through the passages of recovery, um, I think tomorrow or the next day. And so we're going to go through the passages of recovery and what that means. But the most important thing to know in recovery is I've got to start connecting with people, not objects or events. So I'm reversing what happened addictively and literally starting to trust or connect with you. And it's incredibly hard to do. The easiest way to do that is jump into a group. AA was started in 1935. At that time, no one thought an addict could heal of anything. You were going to die on the streets, you are going to be strung out your whole life, and nobody gave you hope. But one addict looked up at another addict and said, hey, buddy. <laughs> Let's hang out. And they started getting well. And so any kind of group, friendship group, where you can look at someone, not have the answer for them, and not to expect the answer from them, but I start to connect with you rather than this drug. When I laugh, I laugh with you rather than because I'm high. I'm going to start to get better. I'm going to start to heal. Um, and heal all the way back from that disconnect and from the molest and from the relationship stuff. And so reconnecting with people is one of the most important 
important things with addictions. And workaholics the same. Get away from your project <laughs> and start to hang out with friends. I mean, and, and if you don't have any, um, and for a lot of workaholics, they have business partners, they have project um, partners that they get involved in, they have ministry partners, but you start asking them about their friendships, and, and for men and women, it, it, that's, that's really dicey. So you start to reconnect. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Does anybody have a question or a comment or... Yes. Smoking. Amen. Um, her partner's heavy smoke as well, and for them to both give up, they've had to both give up the one that's bringing the other one in. Yeah. So smoking addict. So, le so now let me tell you about the mood change with smoking. I, I, I quit heroin easier than smoking. So the, smoking is a really tough. Um, nicotine is a really tough addiction. But when I smoked, it gave me permission to take a break gave me permission to socialize. It gave me permission to do a lot of things. So the mood change that happens with smoking is huge. I can be working 100 miles an hour, and I think, oh, I'm going to go have a cigarette. But what, what, what would you say to a smoking addict whose partner didn't want to give up smoking and they had to deal with that temptation? Yeah, and they can't just shoot their partner? Okay, so, <laughs> all right, not legally. So when, when any time, if I, like um, when I gave up heroin, it was really tough because the person that I probably loved the most in my life, I had to walk away from. So some, sometimes you have to walk away from some folks in your life, and that's tough because um, that literally was the saddest thing that I had had to do in my recovery. With somebody that is going to quit something and their partner is still fully engaged in it, smoking, drinking, whatever, it's, it's, it's tough because the, the level of commitment that you have to have is huge. And so I would make sure that she does everything around it. Eats right, drinks lots of water, gets outside, airs out the house as much as she can. If she, she loves her partner and she's not going to walk away from that relationship, and I'm not saying at all to do that, but do all the things you can. Definitely try to clean up the environment as much as you can, air them out. If you have to, and it's, and it's like, you know, you can smell the drapes of smokers. You know what I mean? You walk in and it's all there. Um, she's going to have to really uh, get some support with other people. Um, um, I, I, when I would quit smoking, I had lemons. I don't know why, but I would just, you, I, I would lemon juice or squeeze lemon. I mean, she's going to have to learn all kinds of like tricks. Um, she's going to try to convince her partner, can you smoke outside? And it's really, it's, you know, it's, it's really tough because what your partner hears is you're not good enough and no 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 this is a hard habit to quit and can you just smoke outside so that it makes it a bit easier um and and that kind of thing and a lot of times if the partner um gets it they'll do that for her um sometimes they just get angry and say no um but you have to do all kinds of tricks when one person cleans up and then another the person doesn't um uh, raise your hand if you know a smoker that's tried to quit <laughs> It's so hard. It's like, you know, and I just want to say, one time I was saying, God, because I'm a, a freak about God. So I'm like, God, um, if you come back right now and I'm smoking, you'll probably just leave me here. And I heard almost uh, God laugh. Are you kidding me? I love you. I'm crazy about you. We don't have any cigarettes in heaven. So, I mean, you're going to have to kind of deal with that at one point. But I just felt like God said, you know what? This is not about my love for you. This is not about who you are as an individual. You have a habit, an addiction that is incredibly difficult. And so just, uh, man, um, do some tricks. If you literally have a partner that is not clean enough. Um, man, for a woman, uh, or for a man or a woman, if your partner is a, a sex addict, raise your hand if you know that they're not present with you when you have sex with them. Oh, you guys, I forgot I'm in New Zealand. You guys don't even talk about sex. All right, so I take that back. I'll just make the point. 
But even for somebody that's lost in their addiction, um, sexually lost in their addiction, they can't be present. And so while you're healing in whatever, you are disconnected with somebody that keeps their sexual addiction. And you know that intimately they are somewhere else in their head. It's very painful. And so you have to be able to even tell yourself that right now I'm healing, I'm very aware of this, I'm going to forgive them every single day, every single time. I'm going to start to... Uh, it's Start to engage with them um, intimately, whether that's by taking a walk or hanging out or laughing or playing golf or whatever. Um, um, but I'm going to know that they can't give me that back right now. And so you start being aware of that kind of stuff because in our recovery, um, and everybody's not going to recover at the same level. And so, so, but I can't not do it. I can't stay sick for you, even though I love you. Do you know what I mean? I've got to do the next steps. But I can't be angry with you and bitter because I'll never be able to recover. You know? So I've got to surrender my resentments and all that kind of stuff. And somebody says, well, how do you do that? Join a group. Go to a group and say, you know what? Today I resent the hell out of my husband. You know? um, and somebody else in the group says, me too. Not my husband, but theirs. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? But you say it out loud, and you process it, and you be able to do that, and you literally can leave, and nobody gave you an answer, but I can survive another day, one day at a time, and I get it, and I, I can look at my husband and just adore him and know that we're just at different places. If he steps in, in, in recovery ahead of me, he does the same thing for me, the same gift for me. But in our recovery, and sorry if I offend anybody with saying um, the H word. <laughs> Is that the only thing I did tonight? Oh, no. <laughs> Somebody says no. <laughs> you offended me a long time ago. <laughs> all right. So, well, um, forgive me for all of that. But it's like in our addiction and we start to do recovery, please don't give the pressure on the people around you. They're going to recover at different uh, times. Your mom with her cigarette smoking and her partner still smoking. She's going to relapse a few times. Um, but tell her, I said, God bless you for that. It's the toughest thing to do, to do recovery when someone else is not. almost expected that she's going to relapse. Mm -hmm. And I'm so ha happy that, she, that she's been smoke-free for the last three or four weeks. Yeah. When she talks to me, she brings it up. But you know, I feel guilty sometimes because I'm a physio. Yeah. And Yeah. And, you know, it, it's hard when it's sort of, um, I didn't want it to affect my relationship with her. And, um, then it's, yeah. it's really tough. When my dad, um, and we'll talk about it probably tomorrow night, but when my stepdad finally did die, his entire esophag uh, esophagus collapsed. He had um, lung cancers and stomach cancers. His liver was shot. And so it is tough to watch somebody you love. Um, all of a sudden end with all of that falling apart. Because you still love them, but they can't swallow. They had to put a stent down his throat, all that kind of stuff, just for him to swallow the last few days. So when you do love somebody that is still lost in their addiction, it's hard not to say, Mom, Mom, please. Um, so, you know, um, ask her forgiveness for, for that you stay on, on her, but just let her know, I can't not say anything because I love you. I'm your son, you know, I'm your daughter. But it's really tough because for, for most of the family members that I have, I love them. Um, my sister, the stripper, she's now 50. She's too old to be a stripper, and she's alone and strung out and trying to kill herself. And, you know, to me, I look at her and I say, I love you. And it's a shame to me that she never figured out or allowed herself to even discover who she is at this point. And so the addictions have robbed her and her lifestyle has robbed her. So for me to say something, even though I, I'm so irritating, like she's like, I know you want me to recover. I'm going to Rio. I'll see you when I get back. And <laughs> so, I mean, she, but it, you can't not say anything. If you love somebody, it's hard not to say, man, um, my prayer for you is that you get your life. Um, and, and what's your mom's name? Uh, Jeannie. Jeannie. So before we leave tonight, um, Pastor, can we add that to our prayer about her and her smoking? Because um, she's just going to, food tastes better. Um, it's amazing to me what happens. Um, like I haven't smoked for 26 years, and I'm so grateful, but it was the hardest thing. Hardest thing I ever did was to give that up. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes. I have not my immediate family, but I have a niece, my older sister's niece, 
um, um, has. And for her wedding, she didn't have anybody that she knew that was normal or religious or whatever. So she called me and she had gotten me a license from the state of California and asked me if I would marry them. And I didn't know um, if that was legal, and I called, and it was, and they give you a license for the day. And, and for her wedding, everybody was wasted um, at the wedding. And in the morning, before they opened the gifts, they had Bloody Marys, because everybody had hangovers, you know, so vodka and, and tomato juice. And so then they were drinking, and I gave her a, a family Bible with... Um, their, her new name on it with her family name and I was so afraid when they opened that because I thought my whole family is going to be offended and she just burst out crying um, but she has um, um, spiritually given her her life to God I got to sit with her in church one day waiting for the sermon I just wept so I think that we do when we choose recovery at any level we generationally turn the tide on what we give to our families you know when for men especially and this is men and I don't want to put a guilt trip on men because they've been pressured a lot um, in bizarre ways you know um, but I want to say that we need you um, as women and children is, is you know, my husband um, um, took him 15 years to step up as spiritual leader of our household, but I needed that. I needed to look at him and know that, you know, his, he is safe and he loves us and he's not strung out and going in different places. And, and when he talks to my daughter, that he talks to her as a father in his own skin, in his own recovery. And so the, every, every part of the family matters. So when somebody's lost in addictions, studies show, especially sexual addictions, that people lost in a sexual addiction are able to love three to seven percent. So 93 percent, they are not with us. They're not with their children. Alcoholics in the same. As they emotionally will be in the room, they physically be in the room, but they're not available on a, in an emotional level. So as people then start acting out and choosing their own addictions, it's because we as adults are so kind of um, pieced out in our own addictions that we're not um, able to give them what they need um, um, in their own life. So as we choose recovery, we give our families... Um, more than we can imagine. It's a, it's a huge deal. We get our life back. We get to laugh out loud in our own skin. We get to love, um, somebody says, wholeheartedly, and, um, and um, our family gets to heal. It's a big deal. It's so cool. Anybody been in recovery or is in recovery? So you know what I'm talking about. Um, and when you start recovery, like I started recovery, and I thought, oh, I stopped heroin, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just the start of it. Like the drug addiction, and we're going to cover this tomorrow, so I'm going to end with this, but we're going to cover this. The drug addiction and stopping that is like 1% of the journey. It's like getting a ticket to a movie. I can't go to the movie unless I have the ticket. So abstinence or recovery is, is needed. But man, the ticket's not the movie. Your life is a movie. Everything that you'll discover about life when you walk away from addiction is huge. But don't stop at just getting a ticket. Don't stop at just quitting the addiction because that's just the beginning. Um, yes? I just wanted to know um, about dealing with the lie in recovery. Yeah. <laughs> so raise your hand if you've ever been in addiction and you have ever told a lie. <laughs> um, addicts, whatever... The addiction are, we lie, we manipulate, sometimes we believe our own stuff. Um, and, and so in addictions, with most groups, when you start going in a group, if you have a, 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 a recovery partner and they're honest enough with you, they'll say, come on, um, that's a lie. You know, and so you start being around people that will give you that feedback in a way that's not shaming. Um, I try to do it in a way that I will say, um, like, man, um, this guy picked me up at the airport in Alaska when I got um, my first gig, and they paid me $100 to speak. I was like, how fun is that? But first gig, and he, w I don't know, he was just old. And so I want to say the story in a funny way because I'm very ADD and sanguine or whatever. So I will say he was 1,000 years old. Does anybody believe he was a thousand years old? But I try to deal with my own stuff is I want to exaggerate and I want to make it funny and I want to whatever. So I'll try to do it big enough 
that that it doesn't you're like thinking he he probably wasn't 92 well i'll say a thousand my 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 husband will say you know what is that jacket new <laughs> what did you pay for that i said 25 cents and he says you did not okay then stop asking me so it's like if <laughs> If you are going to, if you have that in your nature, um, decide for a while um, to, to make it enough to where you can still tell the story, you can still do that kind of stuff, but make it huge, huge. Um, you're never going to be like somebody that says, let's see, was it Tuesday or Wednesday? Man, I think it was 1984 but Wednesday. And they'll stay on that until they get the day right. And I'm thinking, who cares? I don't even remember what year it was. But so don't try to be someone else. Don't try to deal with that. But literally do something that reminds you to be honest. It's a process. Um, it is a process. Lying and manipulation is a part of most addictions. It's a part of, um, raise your hand if, you've, if, you, if you are a liar. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever struggled um, with manipulation or lying. So, you know, it's just, it, for, for a lot of people, it is the issue. It's part of recovery. Yeah. That's not in recovery. That's probably not in yeah. recovery. Yeah. So people that live with an addict that's not in recovery, that's lying. And you expect them not to? Then go to a codependent group. <laughs> no. So people, people that live with an addict that lies or manipulates or acts out, um, if you are expecting any other behavior, then you set yourself up. Addicts do this. Um, get into a group that gives you support until they get into recovery. Because it's part of, it's, it's almost like saying to, um, um, it, it, it's just, it's just, it's kind of the package with addiction. And so when they got in, in, in recovery, what they'll learn is, you know, you've got to stop the addiction, you've got to be honest, you've got to repent, you've got to ask forgiveness for the people you lied to and stolen from, all that stuff. But it is a process. But if you're living with an active addict, um, I just did a group right before I did this group. And I said, we're going to do a group, friendship group, and I love them. But AA, friendship groups, or whatever. When you get here, either ensure what you bring or lock it up. You know, if somebody steals it, like at my house, I have a million dollar umbrella policy on everything I own. If somebody steals this computer, I upgrade. <laughs> I don't even get mad anymore. I know I work with addicts. They're going to steal from me. Um, I, I confront them. I'll do all the stuff we're supposed to do. Even with one addict, I'm in Burger King and we're going through line and I look at him and I realize he's high. I said, are you high? He says, no. And I carry drug testing kits with me when I work with addicts. And I said, would you pee for me? And he's like, right here? You don't have anybody to go in the bathroom with me. So the guy in the line behind us, I said, excuse me, but will you do me a favor? I'm going to send him in to give me a urine sample. He lies all the time. He's high right now. Will you help him? Just give him the bottle. You've got to watch everything. <laughs> this, guy, this guy looked at me like, what? He, this guy is trusting me with his recovery. And I'm not going to do the next thing. I'm not going to be able to do the next thing until I get this urine. I'm going to beg you. Just walk in. Um, don't let him go in the stall by himself. Watch him pee in the bottle and just bring me this cup. And the guy finally looked at me like, first of all, I was from another planet, right? And then he said, okay. <laughs> Walked in, got the urine sample, the guy was high, and I could do the next step. So I don't expect addicts to tell me the truth. Um, when they come to my house, whatever, um, I just don't expect that. I expect you to tell me the truth as you step into recovery and, and further down the line. But some people, I mean, it takes some years before they even know what the truth is. 
Do you know, so it's like being able to say, when you start working in this realm, when you start doing your own recovery work, when you start looking at even why you chose to have addicts in your life, that's a, that's a whole kind of recovery in and of itself. Um, and it's an amazing journey. But man, we got to know that if I'm living with an alcoholic, if I'm living with an addict, if I'm living with a sex addict, if I'm living with somebody that has an addiction, here's kind of the behavioral stuff that will go with that. And I can't be shocked. It's like, are you lying to me? Really? Are you kidding me? You're lying to me? And he's like, no, that's the truth. <laughs> But um, no, that it's really tough. And I don't want to make light of it because it's the most painful thing to know that your child, your husband, your wife, your spouse, you know, it's like when before I got into recovery in my spending stuff, I used to hide things rather than tell Brad, you know what, I work for a living. I could actually buy that without your permission. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I actually had to just get to a point where we said, wait, um, why are we asking permission? You, you know, we, we're partners here. So it's, it's like in our recovery, we actually learn to do it differently um, and we choose not to hide or lie or hide or you know all that kind of stuff um, but uh, you know I'm sorry if, if you're if, if the person that you love is still in their addiction it's painful get into a group don't do this by yourself anybody else yes do what I think it, it was like five or so years, and I think that, that one thing led to another, led to another, so it wasn't just a, like all of a sudden I stopped. It was just that, you know, I stopped a thousand times, and, and at one point, um, uh, you know, I, I had a child, and I looked at her face, and, and, I, and I, <laughs> I even thought, I looked at her face, and I said, you know, I better quit, um, until she's a certain age, and I could start again. And I'm like going to count down. <laughs> it's like, can anybody start a counter for me? And then I thought, oh, I'll wait till she's 18, and then I'll start smoking again. So, I mean, I did that crazy stuff, and then finally God said, why don't you just stop? What? <laughs> you know, because it, it's, it's like, it, you know, it gave me permission to do a lot of things, but it was really tough to finally say to myself, I'm actually a non-smoker. Because I kept dangling it. You know, I can smoke again when. I can smoke again when. I love to smoke. I love pot. I, you know, some drugs are fun. Um, but they, they, they did not help me in my life or in my relationships and my lungs and all that kind of stuff. So I, I didn't walk away from things because I didn't like the effect. I walked away from things because the effect was a lie. It's a lie. Um, if I'm ever going to get my life back, I have to be okay being in my own skin. If I'm ever going to be a good friend, I have to stay connected with the people around me. And the drugs and alcohol and addictions did not allow me to do that. Um, anybody else? Anybody um, work with addicts? Okay. One person, God bless you. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to, yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Amen. And what's really interesting is get to the point where we see, um, man, when I need that mood change, this is what I do. And it's, it's not a bad thing to want a mood change because sometimes we're in horrendous situations. Um, but, but what can I do that's healthy and that will stay with me? Rather, more than just the length of a movie. What actually will stay with me? And start in recovery, it says, that we grab hold of those kind of things. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Some of the stuff you've got to sit and watch is not so healthy. Mm -hmm. I could go for the good old walk. Yeah. 
I do the arts. I took a knitting class. I hung out with, um, yeah. So, Yeah. So how many people are around you that are work, walking out their own addictions? Yeah. So to me, what's really interesting is to be able to look at is I want to start incre increasing. Not I, I will never walk away from my family. I love my family. Um, my sister, the stripper, I told you when she got her breast done, she wanted to show my husband. Look at how nice they look. I'm like, put your top down. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like my, my family is so crazy, but I love them. But I have people around me now that have all, most of my friends, most of the people I hang out with are, are committed to their own recovery so I have a lot of people like even um, Adrian you've got your own recovery journey so it's like being able to have people around you that you can say you know what I trust your journey um, I will never walk away from my sister but I know that when I hang out with my sister I'm talking to a drug I'm talking to an, uh, 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 through her alcoholism. I'm, I'm talking through her sexual addiction and all the pain that she walks around with, whatever. But when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you because you know, you've, you've at least explored some of your recovery. And I can sit down and actually be real and be present and all that kind of stuff. So you start to increase those people in your life and literally start to, to be able to love the people around you, but not with the expectation that they're going to meet your needs, because they cannot. They're, too, they're damaged. But you've got your needs have to be met. So rather than escape into a movie, escape into mood change, and those kind of ways, food, movies, or whatever, is I start to um, um, network to where I'm putting people around me that, uh, that I can get my needs met, I can laugh, I can feel connected, I can go to a group, I can jump in, I can, uh, I, you know, um, I took a knitting class because uh, I needed to learn how to socialize <laughs> so but I mean you start to do those kind of things and, and we're going to talk about that in the next group yeah are you ever pissed off oh yeah <laughs> I love that me too no come up here right now <laughs> no so it's like all that stuff in our recovery of course we're angry are you kidding me uh, you know I'm from a family that can't even look at each other because they're lost in their addiction somebody's got to be angry at that and we're going to talk about that and if I'm angry enough if I'm lost enough I'm disconnected enough I'm going to choose a mood change I'm going to want to get out of my skin and I want to go over here and I want to somehow find something to make me feel better normal that's the way it is until I choose to get well and that's the gift that recovery offers it's like in the in the light of all of that how do I get well and it's possible it's possible for every one of us regardless of what we chose to get well and I am telling you it looks like we're jumping off a cliff and that's a lie we're actually jumping back into our own skin and we get to get our life back um, but it is really intense. I have to deal with the anger. I have to deal with the lostness. I have to deal with the torment, my own demons, that are just all that stuff, the lies that I believe about myself. I have to deal with all of that. And then in the midst of dealing that, I come home to an addict. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I want you to, I want you to be where I'm at. That's not rational. They will not be with you where you're at. But literally, you start to get healthier, everything around you, and they have some place to jump when they get tired. It's amazing what we give to our families. Um, but man, it's tough. And the movie's never long enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, um, 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 it, it doesn't work. It works for a moment. Our sexual addictions work for a moment. Um, our food addictions work for a moment. Um, our workaholism, the project ends. Um, all that kind of stuff. Um, but recovery, because it's real, um, you know, in the pain and joy of recovery, I get to actually um, be in my own skin. And it's so worth it. Is everything perfect? Nope. Are there hard days? Absolutely. Um, but man, I wouldn't trade it for anything because it's the first time in my life that I think my own skin is enough. I'm finally enough. I don't have to shrink and I don't have to puff up. I can actually just walk in. And, um, and it's not for any other reason that I choose to daily do recovery work. Um, 
and do it in a group. Do it with connecting with people. If you need counseling, grab a hold of a counselor. And you know what? Some counselors are going to be crazy. But they may be, for you, you might want to find somebody that deals specifically with anger. When you're done with that, find someone else. But it's like you might find people that will give you little pieces of what you need. It may not be the same person, but you'll find different people that will give you what you need. Groups will always be the most effective because we need to learn to connect because we've been disconnected. So, um, so, so literally start to connect again. And don't connect with an addict because an addict is like trying to connect with mist. Um, they can't be there for you, not because they're mean or not because they don't love you or, or whatever. It's just, the, it's just the beast. Addiction doesn't allow us to be there for each other. So forgive them. Find somebody that's doing their recovery work. Don't leave them. I, 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 the only person in my life that I walked away from was my father because he was so damaging sexually. Um, and I was having a little girl and I didn't want her to be abused in the same way I was abused. And so I talked to him. I forgive you. I love you. But I cannot have you hold my child. And I wept and I had to walk away. So there are some people you'll walk away from um, Forgive them and walk away. Don't walk away in anger because then your, your recovery is harder. Uh, but some people will be in your life and they'll be crazy till their last breath. Um, love them anyway and do your recovery anyway. Okay, I'm switching places with the pastor. I just was, um, thank you for letting me go on and on. Um, if you um, have decided at any level to do um, recovery journey, man, um, God bless you. Um, and, you know, do it. Uh, we're going to talk more about it tomorrow or in the next day. Um, um, but God bless you for that. Okay. Thank you, Sheree. Much appreciated. So uh, just uh, two or three reminders. Um, the table is set up in the foyer if you do want to grab some of those resources that uh, we've mentioned before, that Cherie's mentioned. Uh, that's over there. Refreshments uh, down the hallway to the other warm room. And um, if you need to speak to Wendy about that little group we're starting, I pointed it out to you before. That's Wendy over there. Have a chat with her. Um, we're going to have our ministry teams available to you now, immediately, if you want to pray with us, if you want to talk. Um, judging by some of the questions and some of the struggles, that may very well be the case. So I'm going to close off with prayer for all of us. But then uh, if, you would, um, if, if you're wanting to just stay behind and meet with our teams afterwards, know that we can uh, pray with you one-on-one. -on -one. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy to us. We thank you, Lord, that you've blessed us this evening with, uh, with wisdom, with understanding, uh, judging by the responses that I could see, Lord, it seems like we recognize these patterns. It makes sense to us. It's, it's our stories. And uh, we just pray that you would uh, reach into our hearts and lives and that you would rewire us, that you'd reconnect us, first of all, with yourself and second of all, with other people. And uh, Lord, I, I want to pray tonight in a special way that you would give us courage, courage to face these things and courage to walk that journey. So uh, bless us now as we go our separate ways and, uh, and stay close to us in Jesus' name. Amen.